our presentation is on Ascend and our collaboration with the San Francisco Police Department uh, and their crisis in intervention team program. Uh, next slide, we'll be that, so that, uh, and there, here we are, that's Camilla and that's me. Uh, next slide, and next slide, please. Uh, we'll be going over this, so this is for the syllabus. Next slide, please. All right, <clears throat> what is uh, Ascend? Uh, by the way, the name was Autism Asperger Spectrum Coalition for Education Networking and Development. Um, and our name actually says what we are, and that's why it's so long. We are an all-volunteer nonprofit uh, we are, we are actually, our mission was was specifically directed to adults on the autism spectrum, which distinguished us from other organizations uh, at the time. Uh, that was very much our focus from the start, Ad adult support advocacy and action. We uh, were established in 1999 and now we're one of the oldest adult autism groups in the United States and the largest in California. Uh, many of our founding members are, are still with us and we've become a real community through the years. Next slide, please. We are adults on the spectrum. Uh, so we have three parts. Uh, we're ad ad autistic adults, their family members and friends, and then professionals who work with them. 20% of our members are on regional center clients. By the way, our structure is unusual in this, in that we, are coll we collaborate in this way and I, th I think it works very well. Uh, many of our members uh, are falling through the cracks of existing autism support systems. Uh, many don't qualify for services such as regional centers or, social, or SSI, and of course, have difficulty with competitive employment and independent living. Our board, our nonprofit board, is 50% on the autism spectrum and 50% neurotypical. So it's a really interesting group that we get together with. Uh, used to get together in person, and now we meet uh, our board meets on Zoom. Our, uh, we span a wide range of uh, ages and we're multi-generational and we do encourage replication of our model. We don't exactly franchise it, but we encourage people to copy what we do. Next slide, please. So here's uh, some of the things we do. Uh, we have monthly general meetings, which are now on Zoom. Boy, do we miss the brick and mortar meetings. Looking forward to those coming back because they were such a warm events. Uh, but we do the best we can on Zoom where we have speakers, book discussions, social events, media presentations. Uh, if you go to ascend.org and just scroll down, you'll see uh, some of the many things we've done through the years. All the uh, announcements for those old meetings are still there uh, online. Uh, <clears throat> we have a monthly job club, yeah, an in-person job club meeting, which is now on Zoom uh, with speakers, networking, problem solving. And uh, we have a weekly online job club meetings with individual support for people, uh, uh, autistic adults looking for job for work. And we have a monthly TV program, Life on the Autism Spectrum. If you wanna see that, just Google uh, Ascend uh, TV YouTube and that'll get you pointed in the right direction or Life on the Autism Spectrum. Uh, I strongly recommend you check that out. Next slide, please. Okay, um, we, uh, we have a LinkedIn uh, community, Spectrum Employment Community on LinkedIn. Please join that. And we have uh, social events. We've had uh, at least 10 major conferences, usually run in collaboration with, the, with uh, San Francisco State. Uh, those have been wonderful events. And, um, but of course, everything's shut down now. And finally, and the subject of our, ta subject of our talk today, uh, our collaboration with the San Francisco Police Department. And to discuss that in detail, I will hand uh, this presentation over to Camilla. Thank you, Greg. Why the SFPD? Uh, we had to decide, um, you know, what program we were going to do. So we we thought we had twofold motivation. We had fears as a parent and the experience of our Ascend members. Um, next slide, please. Okay. So um, as personally as a parent. Um, in elementary school, my son had uh, terrible meltdowns that later dissipated, thankfully. But at the time, I thought if this continues into his adult life, he's going to end up in prison or some terrible thing is going to happen to him. So what to do? What, when they dissipated, I felt greatly relieved and I thought, well, that problem is solved. 
But what I didn't realize then is that being atypical is a significant risk factor for police interaction. Even something that you wouldn't think of like spatial difficulties are a real source of problem on public transportation, standing in line, getting too close to people. Um, how can I, I know my son said to me the other day, how can I do direction and space at the same time? In other words, how can I determine what direction I'm going in and give myself the required uh, appropriate space and figure those two things out at the same time? Next slide, please. Okay, um, so we had the parental fear and that drove us uh, in that direction, but we also had our ASCEND member experience. And what we found is our members had a higher rate of interaction with law enforcement than um, their typical peers. Uh, they were victims of crime, they were victims of police misunderstanding, and they were uh, victims of public misunderstanding. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, so our members were victims of crimes. One of our members was sexually assaulted. Someone came to the front door and asked for a glass of water, someone she didn't know. She said, of course, and let that person, she didn't let the person in, but the person uh, just pushed through the open door and sexually assaulted her. One of our other members was a victim of fraud. He was standing at a bus stop and somebody pulled up in a car and said, could you help me? And he said, well, of course I can. And it ended up after they were, told him that maybe they could help him find a girlfriend and that he was a great guy and lots of fun. And they got him to cash a fraudulent check for $5,000 out of his um, bank account. In both cases, um, our members needed help and support in reporting the crime. Um, next slide, please. Okay, so um, we have the victims of misunderstanding by the public as well. The police uh, can be called in these situations. One of our members likes shiny things. And he was looking in car windows. The, somebody saw him, called the police and said, someone is breaking into cars. And um, that led to a lot of problems. Again, sitting or standing too close on public transportation in stores, bumping into people on the street, stepping on toes. Um, it's, it's a problem for our members. Uh, the member who steps on toes um, refuses to apologize because he didn't do it intentionally. So that causes problems. And uh, some of our members have been um, thrown out of places. In one case, the police were called because um, they were on something. They were on autism. Uh, next slide, please. Okay. And then uh, they're victims of police misinterpreting autistic traits. So one of our members was physically grabbed by a TSA agent at the airport and thrown into a, a person-sized plexiglass box because they were different, they were odd and atypical and therefore a threat and a danger. So our anecdotal experiences of high interaction with law enforcement align with national data. Next slide, please. So we decided, okay, we have to educate and protect ourselves. So we shared our experiences. We watched Emily Island's uh, movie, Be Safe, Be Safe the Movie. Um, she has a, a really wonderful curriculum uh, to train police and often works with her son, Tom Island. We role played, uh, we discussed autism identification cards. Um, some people carry them, but we have to train people not to reach for those cards if they're with the police. Um, disclosure is an issue for some of our members. They wouldn't want to carry a card. They have to weigh that with um, the dangers of uh, police misinterpreting. And we uh, counsel people to keep a support person information card in their wallet. Uh, next slide, please. So we decided, okay, we can educate ourselves, but we also have to educate the police. So we invited the police to come in. Uh, Commander Mosier came to our meeting and he watched the movie with us. He's now, by the way, DC Mosier, Deputy Chief. And he gave us advice for interacting with the police. And he pointed out that really, the greatest risk to adults with autism is the failure to comply to commands. And we're gonna talk about that a little later. Um, and he suggested developing an autism training video for the officers. Now it's um, my understanding that uh, Chief Scott uh, was here uh, two years ago and um, was well received by the group and showed the video. So we're just going to show a little um, two minute clip from KTVU about the video. Okay, 
Uh, please. Conference on autism in San Francisco will recognize the city's police department for making a groundbreaking training video for officers on how to recognize and deal with people living with autism. Here at five tonight, KTVU's Tom Baker joins us now with why this training video may save lives. Tom. And we're talking about 720,000 people in California alone that have autism. Next month, the San Francisco Police Department will start training all officers how to avoid or reduce conflicts with those folks who have autism. It took a year for the San Francisco police and autism activists to create this training video. In making this video, we were hoping to uh, give our officers an extra tool in which to recognize some of the traits of individuals who are on the autism spectrum. Camilla Bixler is an autism activist and a mother of a son with autism. A lot of autistic traits are um, pretty easily misunderstood. We felt that there was a um, need for some kind of collaboration and need to really train officers. This can reduce unnecessary arrests and violent confrontations. And though the tape has experts, law enforcement officers, and even a dramatization, it presents something far, far more important. Perhaps the most unique aspect of this video is people on the spectrum talking about themselves. My name is Joshua Schwartz. I'm on the autism spectrum. It, it's hard for me to make eye contact. That doesn't mean I'm being dishonest or trying to lie. I am very sensitive to touch. It can be very painful, so I might put pull away. I'm not fighting or resisting. I like shiny objects. I like the reflection of people's glasses, but I'm not trying to invade their safety zone. People often point out to me that I'm not making eye contact. It, it, that's just that's just how I normally conduct myself. Sometimes people on the spectrum laugh at, an un, at unusual times. They just do it. I don't know why. They're not mocking any, anyone. In their own words. I believe that that's probably one of the most powerful pieces of the video, is actually um, seeing traits and, and hearing uh, members from the uh, autism community speak about the traits. That video training begins next month for all current SFPD officers and every new one thereafter. Tom Baker, KTVU Fox 2 News. So uh, when we made the video, there was a great um, interest among, uh, we were surprised in fact, how great the interest was, but many of the officers have family members with IDD and autism. We got people involved in actually writing the video. We, as you saw, a variety of voices speaking for themselves. The fathers, um, the police officers in the video uh, were in the dramatization in the video were fathers of autistic girls. So they were very um, committed. And through this video project, which lasted a year, we became involved with CIT. Next slide, please. Okay, so crisis intervention team CIT is a national movement and it trains officers to work more effectively with people in behavioral health crisis, uh, people with behavioral differences. The heart, I have this in blue, the heart of CIT is time, distance, de-escalation de versus command and control. That's really the essential difference. And everything that establishes command and control, lights, sirens, shouted commands, multiple commands, all of this makes, it mu makes the situation much worse for autistics. Uh, next slide, please. So uh, every month we have a CIT stakeholders group in San Francisco, and that's law enforcement, Office of Police Accountability, District Attorney's Office. And interestingly enough, at the District Attorney's Office is the Mental Health Division, um, Department of Public Health, Mental Health Organizations, Suicide Prevention, et cetera, community members. We have monthly meetings, uh, quarterly meetings with uh, Chief William Scott. And next slide, please. Okay. And one of the things we do at each monthly meeting is review the data. So we see the number, they have a dashboard that's been developed in the last two, uh, several years. Number and kind of behavioral calls are included in the dashboard. The use of force and the injuries to both um, the individual and to the officers, the ethnicity, gender, age. And uh, they're now considering adding IDD and autism data uh, to the dashboard. Next slide, please. So. Um, we uh, participated, ASCEND participated in a CIT training and we did a, a presentation. And one of the things that we stressed in the presentation 
is instead of the typical command, 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 and then expect compliance, we try to uh, stress with the officers that it needs to be command, compliance, command. And we provided um, a panel of some of our adult members and it was quite well received and I'd like to uh, show that video now. I would like to introduce myself. I'm Paul Nussbaum and I'm 63 years old and I've been diagnosed on the autism spectrum at age 40 in 1997. One of my biggest accomplishments was hiking the Pacific Crest Trail, 1600, 1600 miles of the Pacific Crest Trail in the summers of 2018 and 2019. And also overcoming the challenges on my PCT expedition. And now I'm in the process of writing a, writing a book about it. Sometimes I have trouble explaining why I'm doing doing something. And this and it particularly occurs when I'm under when I'm under stress. And reducing the, reducing the stress helps me to be able to process the information better, so I can explain what it is I'm doing, whether it is for instructions, answering questions, etc. Is I am I am overwhelmed uh, when it comes to multitasking, uh, particularly in stressful situations. What helps me is to be able to reduce the stress in the situation. And also, if I can move through the process one step at a time, that that really helps. That really helps me a lot. What would be difficult for me with meeting an officer would be to would be number one for me being under a lot of stress for this, for the situation, and number number two, uh, getting receiving the instructions too fast and and being required to multitask. A police officer would could misunderstand my behavior if they if they see me uh, reacting acting out in in the in a stressful in a stressful situation. And and then I could appear to be like I'm being belligerent or or being I mean non non cooperative or it could appear to be dangerous. The thing that they should know about autism is that it's a neurological disability and, and also the, and the, awareness of, and the awareness of the behaviors. I mean, like the, the behaviors may appear menacing, but in reality, I mean, the intent is not there. There could be some public safety issue related to the behavior but the, the behavior is not, there's no intention on, on the person's part to, to do that behavior. If anything, they want to de-escalate that behavior. They want to get rid of that behavior. Um, hi, my name is Brian Hayes, and uh, I'm very proud of being uh, on the autism spectrum. So, and um, I love living in San Francisco. And sometimes if my mind wanders off and, you know, I just go off into a sort of a <laughs> thinking sort of state. Um, but uh, I'm always distracted by other things that are always popping up out of nowhere. <laughs> sometimes I have troubles explaining things sometimes. If I have to stand up and I can't really move anywhere, and somebody is like telling me to, you know, move something unless I stepped on their foot or something. Uh, if I can't do it, I can't do it. Yes, I do. Um, uh, some of my favorite movies and TV shows, I sometimes do that, um, especially when it's funny scenes. So I try to get as much laughter out of it as possibly as I can. So. <laughs> Um, if I've memorized it, classic lines, funny lines, sometimes dramatic stuff. So, uh, the stuff that really intrigues me, uh, one of my favorites, uh, I guess would be from like Independence Day with the sort of Independence Day speech from, uh, uh Bill Pullman's character or something that maybe Will Smith might have said before, like in Men in Black or uh, Independence Day or, um, uh, I guess, uh, what's the other one? Bad Boys or something like that. So, uh, <laughs> um, 
Ghostbusters, Bill Murray, so uh, he slimed me. That's great in physical contact. <laughs> What they should know is that not everybody that is on uh, that has that is on the autism spectrum is Rain Man. So that's one thing. Um, I've never seen that movie yet, so but I want to. But uh, the point is that everybody is very different uh, the way that they think and the way that they react to things and how they uh, uh, perceive the world around them and the way they talk too, because most of them can't even talk. So. A lot of them are very low function at that they only make sounds and stuff, but um, that they, all of them are thinking. That's one thing we all have in common. We all think it's just not the same. Yes, I think that a lot of people that are on the autism spectrum should be given a, uh, a very f fair chance of being able to explain the situation if they're in a um sort of scenario where they're involved with the police because they're not always going to be able to speak out loud so i think the police may need to um do research and actually uh, assess the, the situation at hand but not like with an average person the, these are people that are disabled so they need to take their time and be patient with people that are on the spectrum Period. Because right, if right. I said that to an actual officer, I probably wouldn't have said it the exact same way that I right. would have compared to just saying it to you. I was like, yeah, I know you, so I can say that. Mm -hmm. But in the actual moment at hand, I'm like, what did I just say? <laughs> I'm pretty sure it's about to pop up in there. <laughs> okay. Hi, I'm Andrew Bixler, and I'm proud to have a job and live independently. Last time I had touch matters was with dad when on a streetcar. I stood in front of some guy and then I brushed his hand off me. Fortunately, it wasn't an incident. When I brushed his hand off, that's the last thing I remember. I've had trouble when, when sitting or standing too close to someone on buses because you know, buses are too small at some degree. That's why I try to walk when I can. Well, well to everyone, and space is a matter, you know that. There are also times when that problem can't be solved. Well, the last time I had a matter with that was at was at fan was at fan fest. When I was yeah, you know, you know how you know how big and those crowds are and such each year. So last year when I I remember I kind of sort of remember the lad, yeah, the young man right in front of me, and so Figured I stared too close like that and scared him away. Well, sometimes, for instance, I might at least recall sketches from Eureka's Castle, one of those old Nickelodeon shows, and it had Muppet-like characters in a medieval castle. It's not necessarily around others. Sometimes showing people is easier, and sometimes even texting can be easier. Usually I say one thing, usually I say one thing is at a time is best, mm -hmm. and otherwise it's confusing. We have them just do one thing at a time. They um, can't multitask. Some things are are easy to be misunderstood between us. Well, I'm not sure what to say to them next. Hmm. Let's hope they understand us at least. So I uh, just wanted to look at SFPDCIT uh, and it was established in 2011. Um, San Francisco is really a leader because of the caliber of their training and their robust data collection. Its uh, participation is voluntary for officers. So there are approximately 2,000 officers in San Francisco uh, PD and um, 1,200 have been trained. Right now, as I said, the participation is voluntary, but Chief Scott has been uh, considering the possibility of having uh, CIT 
having been CIT trained as uh, a consideration for advancement. I think that'll make a difference. Uh, 40 hours of classroom instruction, including role play. And I think what really set San Francisco apart is the 10 hours of tactical training, um, showing the officers how to put the theory into practice. Next slide, please. Okay. Um, yeah, one of the problems with defund the police is the police need more training, not less. And with this robust data collection, we've been able to see that there's been a significant downward trend in the use of force and behavioral health calls in San Francisco. Next slide, please. Okay, and um, we're gonna skip over the ARC dance right now. And um, there's new trends in crisis response. So, uh, and CIT is working with the Department of Public Health, sending out two psychologists with certain mental health calls. There's a street crisis response team, which is going to be led by the fire department and without uh, police involvement. And virtual reality is a new training tool, both for autistic individuals, I think the program is from Florio, and for law enforcement on how to, to respond to calls for service. I looked at the material, it was um, quite good and ironically developed by Axon, who, who's the you know, maker of tasers. Okay, next slide, please. Okay, so as we know, it's a confusing time for law enforcement. Um, the calls for defunding the police. My concern is that it's going to lead to reduced CIT training. Um, and with fewer officers, if the funds are really reduced, the fewer officers are gonna make the core principles of time, distance, and de-escalation de harder to adhere to. Okay, next slide, please. Okay, um, just uh, giving, a, <laughs> I have one minute left, so I'm trying to figure out how to do this. Um, I, it's, this is pretty common sense, but the idea is be prepared to answer the questions, even if you have to have them printed out, uh, even if you have to have all of the information. So if you're flustered in, a, in making a, an emergency call, um, are there triggers? Um, the person from dispatch said, be sure to tell them if there are sensory issues so they can approach without lights and siren. And um, is the person afraid of police? Does the individual have access to weapons? This is uh, very important. And next slide. Okay, and we may be getting smart uh, 911. And next slide. And so our conclusions are that, um, you know, the potential for misunderstanding of by autistic individuals, by the police and the general public remains high and remains dangerous. It's our job to educate our community and to educate law enforcement. I'm beginning to think that we may even start to have IEP goals or IPP goals on this topic. So we need uh, initiatives at every level and that the in-person interaction with law enforcement is a powerful educational opportunity. I just wanna say when we had our adult panel uh, we were right before lunch and they had been sitting there since uh, seven o'clock in the morning and the officers were sitting with their arms, arms folded, kind of looking. And when the adult panel came on, they moved forward and they were fully engaged. And I, uh, I was watching from the side, as, you know, a longtime teacher, I was watching from the side, watching their body language. And it was quite remarkable. When 12 o'clock came, I didn't see one person uh, looking at their phone or looking at a watch. So this in-person interaction is a powerful educational opportunity. Okay, thanks.